Okay, um, good morning, everyone. I hope you understand me. And I also want to thank the organizers, obviously, to invite me to speak here. And I'm a medical oncologist, and that means I'm only speaking about metastatic prostate cancer. To start a short overview, as Tullio Sulso has already shown you, um, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in males in the Western world. And you have to remind that a similar number of men die from prostate cancer as women from breast cancer. But somewhat, prostate cancer is still much more neglected than breast cancer. The standard treatment in the metastatic setting is androgen deprivation therapy. And that means basically castration. With a response rate of 90%, and the median response duration of about 18 months. So it's not curative. The metastases are mainly in the bones, and they are mainly osteoblastic, and therefore difficult to assess, and they can cause severe morbidity. The main driver for prostate cancer are androgens. And most of the testosterone comes from the testes. So in earlier days, the castration was mostly done by orchiectomy, and nowadays mostly by so-called chemical castration by LHRH agonists. And here you see the typical cause of a prostate cancer patient. Most of the patients nowadays we see with localized disease and they are treated, as Tullius Sulsa has pointed out. But a third of the patients, about a third, have a recurrence and they develop metastasis. Still, some patients are diagnosed in the metastatic setting. And as we have said, the mainstay of therapy then is castration. And most of the patients respond to that castration but all of the patients develop resistant at some time point to castration. And then we're speaking about castration-resistant prostate cancer. And you find that now with the CRPC in a lot of my slides. So this is the castration-resistant prostate cancer setting. And until 2010, this was really a desert in our therapeutic options. We had only one therapy that was a chemotherapy called docetaxel that had shown an overall survival benefit and nothing else. But now it looks much better. So here you see the landscape today. In the last four years, five additional therapies have been approved that have shown an overall survival benefit. You can give them before docetaxel or after docetaxel. And the good thing is our patients really live longer with these new therapies. And that's a typical oncology slide, but just to let you know um, where these substances work. So these are new hormonal treatments. You've probably heard of them, abirachon and enzalutamide. They were also a lot in the press. Then there's one new chemotherapy, capacitaxel, that has shown an overall survival benefit. There's the immunotherapy with cipulucil T that has been approved in the States and also newly in Europe. And there is a alpha emitter called radium-223 that has only sh also shown an overall survival benefit that's mostly working on the bones. So let's go to imaging. What are we using in routine? So we're still using bone scans. And again, be reminded that bone scans are actually not measuring the tumor, but osteoblast activity, but we're still using it in routine. And it's not so bad for presence and distribution of bone metastasis for primary diagnosis. And depending on the findings, we do further imaging, like an MRI long spine if necessary. If patients are untreated, patients with prostate cancer, they develop pathologic fractures in about 20% of the patients and spinal cord compression in about 7% of the patients. We also use CT scans for visceral metastasis and lymph node metastasis. <laughs> 
So what do we need from you since we have two options? And the Beatles have solved that problem a long time ago. But if we go to a little bit more scientific, what we really need is good methods to monitor treatment effects. We have so many good new drugs, so we need to know what's working. And in everyday practice, we don't want to stop effective treatment too early, for example, because of flare, I'll show you that later, but we also don't want to miss real disease progression. And in clinical trials, we would have ideally an imaging or changes in imaging that can be used as a surrogate for overall survival. So the trials don't take so long and we can get the active substances earlier into clinic. We would also like to detect impending severe complications timely, like, as I mentioned, spinal cord compression, and ideally with a simple procedure, because a lot of my patients really don't like the bone scans and look like geriatrics here when they come out of the bone scans. So why is the assessment of response in prostate cancer so difficult? Because patients have mainly osteoblastic bone metastasis, and these are really hard to measure. And you see here a very recent publication that looked at assessment in patients at that site who only lived for less than three months, and at that site on patients who lived more than two years at the time of, after the time of assessment. And you see in early castration-resistant prostate cancer, most patients have only bone metastasis. Later, they develop visceral metastasis in about up to 50%. And we see a lot of patients now with liver metastasis, lung metastasis, and even brain metastasis. And that's because we have more effective treatment and patients live longer. And bone metastases are classified as non-target lesions by RECIST. RECIST stands for Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumors. And it's standard criteria for measuring and monitoring tumor burden. The first version was published in 2000, the updated version in 2009. And it's a very helpful tool for us oncologists because it's a standardized measurement of lesions. So in CT scans, you should measure the longest diameter, and it should be longer than 10 millimeters, in all lesions, in lung, in liver, with the only exception of lymph nodes, where you should report the short axis of the lymph node, and that should be at least 15 millimeters, in prostate cancer, even 20 millimeters. And from these measurements, we can do standardized response criteria, what is really helpful. So I'll show you a case just to demonstrate it can be difficult to assess treatment response. This is a patient of mine, 70 year old gentleman, very good performance ski, uh, status. Um, by the way, a very good skier, he would like the both. And he was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer in 2011. He had a Gleason score of 8, that's a rather aggressive cancer. And he started at that time with castration, as we have discussed the standard treatment. About a year later, he had progression of disease, rising PSA, progression in bone scan, and also progression of his lymph node metastasis. And we started him on chemotherapy with docetaxel. That was the standard at that time. After four cycles, he went down with his PSA from 32 to 5. In bone scan, he had the same lesions, no new lesions, with a lower intensity. And the CT scans you see on that slide. So that's the CT scans before we started chemo. That's the CT scans after four cycles of chemo. And you see the lymph node metastases have really been decreased in size, but in the bone, you see more enhanced sclerosis and even newly visible lesions. So what are we doing with this patient? And this is unusual. No. It's a so-called CT flare response, and it has been described in this paper. And the conclusion of this paper was that in patients with a PSA decrease and response 
or stable disease in soft tissue disease, an increase in bone sclerosis can be interpreted as flare and is likely to represent a response to therapy and not a progression. So CT is obviously not so ideal for bone metastasis. Should we just leave it out? Should we omit it? And here is a published case from a 62-year-old gentleman. Again, diagnosis for prostate cancer long ago, 2006. A little bit less aggressive prostate cancer. He got radiation therapy uh, for PSA rise, but then 2010 he had diagnosis of lymph, lymph node and bone metastasis. And again, as you know now, he started on castration. Again, a year later, he had a PSA rise to 150, progression in bone scan and in his lymph nodes. And again, he was started on chemotherapy with docetaxel. He responded very well. After eight cycles, he had a dramatic decrease in PSA to 1.5. His bone scan was stable, and he had a partial response in his lymph nodes. So docetaxel was continued, and after 10 cycles, PSA was still 1.5, very low. But what you found in the CT scan, so you see the PSA again here, so it was low and it wasn't rising, but in the CT scan, you see multiple liver metastases. And these were also histologically looked at, and you see here the immune histochemistry for PSA was negative. So no wonder the PSA didn't rise. But obviously this patient is progressive. So CTs are important for solid lesions. But again, what are we doing about monitoring the bones? And if you don't know what to do, you sometimes look up in your guidelines, at least we oncologists do, and that's the European Society of Medical Oncology um, guideline from 2013. And monitoring, imaging for monitoring is not even mentioned. Then the American guidelines um, have a general chapter about imaging, but don't really mention monitoring. And in the European Association of Urology guidelines from last year, they just say osteoblastic bone metastasis remain difficult to quantify. So we have a problem here. So what's helping us a little bit, at least, is Howard Schurz, that he knows well, um, prostate cancer clinical trials working group criteria that help us to um, have some standardization. And it's the last version, that's the version two, that has been published in 2008. And I think Howard is now working on the next one. But he said, at, that time, at the time being, we should only use bone scans for assessing bones. And again, also he says, reliable methods to assess changes in bone are of increasing importance. But you should know that also in bone scans, there is bone flare, not only in CT scans, also in bone scans. They are transient, but they are rather frequent and have been described in about up to 48%. And it's a little bit complicated, but the definition of progression in bone scans is the appearance of two or more new lesions. And for the first assessment after starting a therapy, you need a confirmatory scan later with two or more additional lesions. So you see that depicted here. This is a nice paper from Michael Morris. Um, so if your patient starts therapy here with two spots in the bone scan, and three months later, the first assessment, he has two more spots, you have to wait another six to 12 weeks and do another s bone scan. And if it's not two more lesions here, he's considered to be not progression. If you have two two spots at baseline and four after three months, and three months later, so six months after start of treatment, you have six spots, then it's considered progression. So always keep that in mind if you write progressive in your report. So what do we wish for, actually? We would really like to have better methods 
for assessing screening and monitoring of bone metastasis. We still rely a lot on clinical symptoms and also on PSA levels. And we would really like you to use RECIS criteria that is really nice for the measuring so we can try to compare different reports from different radiologists and try to be careful with the word, word progressive because patients reading their radiology reports more and more and for them progressive is a frightening word. And in the end, in prostate cancer, the definition of progression is always a comprehensive assessment for clinical features, for PSA levels, and with imaging. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I also take the opportunity, perhaps, for thanking our radiologists and nuclear medicine people in, in uh, St. Gallen for very, very good collaboration, because I think that's really crucial for good patient care. Thank you very much. <laughs>